All right, welcome back to the World Tellers Podcast. We are dropping like flies around here. <laughs> uh, just me and Finn this morning. Josiah's got a headache. He's got a headache, and John, I think he, he had a busy... John's life is very busy right now. <laughs> yeah, he and Lauren have a lot going on, so... A lot going on. It's all good, yeah. Um, we, um, we do miss them, though. But we're. Yeah. It, it should be a lot more wisdom on this episode. Yeah. You'll get more a lot clarity more, of thought. Get a lot more out of this one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't have to size notebook yeah, to go off of, have, so we'll have to fill the space. Yeah. We miss you, Josiah. We do. Um, we were going to jump into uh, the garden, Jesus in the garden, but we're going to take a little different approach this morning. Mm-hmm. Um, we're gonna, we've, asked, <laughs> we've asked chat GPT. 25 biblical worldview questions to, to, to generate to 25 ge- world, yeah, to generate yeah. no, we didn't ask chat gpt's yeah. uh <laughs> take on the biblical worldview yeah um and so we're gonna fire them off maybe we should though we'll find, <laughs> we'll find yeah out. we got google in the background too yeah. um but we're gonna fire these off and do our best to answer them to the best of our ability yeah and so it's kind of um you guys get to go along for the journey. Ask yourselves how you would answer these questions as they come up. Um, because I, I, I know, I feel like I've got a very secure, solid perspective, worldview, understanding. Obviously, I don't know all things. Nobody does. But everybody's got to filter whatever information, decision-making, perspective-taking. It even happens in the background without realizing it, which is probably the worst-case scenario just being blown to and fro with every wind and doctrine, um, not having a solid foundation or a, an anchor that's holding you in place. That That's true. Now, some people, anyways, long story short, everybody's going to filter whatever questions they hear through their worldview, their perspective that mm-hmm. they take for granted as being true, that they have placed their faith in. Everybody's living on, in a sense, faith-based assumptions. Um, so anyways, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a good exercise. I think it um, it helps you develop why you believe why you what you believe to think uh, through it. Yeah, be able to articulate it because you might say I believe that, but how would I explain that or yeah. share that? Yeah. Um, it's kind of Mike Winger does a thing on Fridays where he takes it's like a live Q and A. Does he do twenty or twenty? Is it twenty? He used questions? to do twenty. He does ten now. Yeah, because he um, could, he couldn't get yeah shorter than an hour. <laughs> We've got twenty five. We'll yeah. almost certainly not get through them. But yeah, um, we'll do our best. Yeah, and he all he's always pretty spot on. So his, I can't his promise. answers will be better than <laughs> his, ours. Yeah, for so we'll we'll redirect you to Mike Winger. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we'll. Uh, all right. Here's the first question. How do you define faith and how does it differ from belief? Hmm. How do you define faith and how does it differ from belief? What what, what do you think, Brett? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I was banking on you to I've got some no, thoughts. Um but... I think I think belief is um, a mental, a mental assent to something like an, an intellectual mm-hmm. um, acknowledgement of something. Um, whereas faith is is the is the mental um, or the intellectual acknowledgement, but also leading to um, living out that belief. Well, that would be my first take on it. Mm. And I think I think faith gets thrown around. It's like uh, religion is a faith thing, and science is like reason. Yeah, or and if I, faith, religion is a no evidence. Exactly, yeah, it's yeah. like it's believing with no evidence, completely absurd. But you're just blindly blind faith. You hear it. You hear it all the time. But it's like you, you're not putting. It's not blind faith. Mm-hmm. There's a there's an understanding and a, and a deeper spiritual. Um, component to it there's a giving giving self giving yourself over to something in a way that is um yeah i I think it's anything but i heard a guy recently 
Jordan Hall, and he was basically saying like the world's perspective on what faith is now is basically like maximal delusional thinking. Mm-hmm. It's like, look, you're just putting your faith in in Santa Claus or the fairy godmother. It's it's just silly. There's no substance there. There's no realness there. There's nothing true there, and you're just blindly just being quote unquote religious, and that's silly. And um, it's almost the exact opposite of that. It's like I've searched, I've seen, I, I've, I've, I've thought through these issues and I come up against something that's transcendent, mm-hmm. something that's beyond what I can comprehend. And, and it points to something. It points to there being a creator, a, a transcendent being that has everything else is contingent and, and resting upon like there, there, nothing else would exist if this being did not exist. Like there's a, a deeper understanding that's like it, it all points to mm-hmm. a creator a transcendent god and then um obviously through the scriptures we're revealed who that person is and ultimate the ultimate manifestation is christ the second person of the trinity coming in the flesh the transcendent reality that is the uncreated creator of all things has now broken into that and it's um so yeah what's the difference back to the question because i'm rambling what's the difference between faith and belief I guess I personally use them interchangeably to some point. I think you can draw some distinctions, but, um, and I, I think both of them get thrown around and belittled and like cheapened. I think that there is, um, like belief, for example, is, um, again, I've heard the second hand and I'm trying to repeat it. So I don't, it's, it struck, it rung true with me. And I'm like, I, 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 what is being said there? resonated as being true and it's like yes belief is not just simple um yeah i i mentally assent to that it can be that i believe that two plus two is four Uh in fact i know it to an extent um but other things like i I believe that the united states is the greatest country in the world Uh okay um you can judge it on different metrics depending on how but belief in this sense in the spiritual context i think is very much similar to is to well, I guess you, before you can have, <laughs> I'll say this before, I'll try to finish this thought because I'm rambling, but belief is basically like a giving yourself over to something <laughs> in in a way that is um, deeper than just a mental ascent, but it's a full, if this is the case, not only do I believe mentally that that's the case, but I'm actually walking in that reality too, because it's it's so true. I believe that that is the case. So it's like, if we're in this room, if I want to get out, I have to walk through that door. I believe that there's a door there. I can, I can see it. I can observe that there's a door there. I can see the handle. And if I want to get out, I have to walk through that door. I can, you know what I'm saying? So there's, um, yeah, that's a good, I don't, I, I don't see a huge difference, but I might be missing a, a, a massive flaw there. Um, I think this is just kind of how I see it. Belief is, all right, there's a chair sitting here. Mm-hmm. I believe that if I sat down in that chair, that it would hold me up. And I think faith is actually sitting down in the chair. Mm. So faith is the, the walking it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think we leave I it there. Can, yeah, I think that's good. good that's a simple, way better than what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right question two what biblical passages have had the most impact on your world view hmm. well i know mine yeah. what is yours go ahead I let it mine is galatians 2 20 hmm. um i have been cru- paul says i have been crucified with christ and is no longer i who live but christ that lives <coughs> in me In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. Um, And, I mean, to me, that was a transformative one that really, and we've talked about it many times on the podcast before, but really transformed. uh, To to me, that is the Christian life. That is Christianity in a nutshell. It is, I have been crucified with Christ. So like my, my, the death of the old man, the flesh, the, the, the self that was in Adam, the sinful man has been crucified with Christ. I, I didn't do it on my own. I didn't, wasn't able to just achieve this, this transcendence from my sinly, my sinful flesh. 
on my own. No, it was because of Christ's death on the cross, his crucifixion, that I get to be a partaker in that <coughs> through faith. Um, and the old man, and I can reckon now that the old man has been crucified and done away with. The sinful part of me that's just like, always seems to be at war with my true identity on who, sure. who I am now in Christ. And it's like the life I now live in the flesh, but before that he says, is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. Like that's a radical statement. That's saying like, look, the, the second person of the Trinity, God himself now lives in you and he is living his life out through you. It's no longer I, but it's Christ in me. And that's also answers the purpose of what we were created for to manifest the glory of God through, through us in our lives. That's what God's desire is. And we do that only through submission and surrender. Mm -hmm. It's no achievement on our part and he gets all the glory. And, um, in the life we now live, we live by faith. It's like, it's a trusting in it's sitting in the chair. Like you said, it's believing it's there and thinking it, knowing or believing it will hold your weight and then stepping out in faith and, um, sitting in it. So yeah, Galatians 2.20 to me, I think is a, a beautiful summary of the Christian mm. life. Mm. Solid. What about you? Mm. Also Galatians 2.20? Nah, uh, <laughs> I would say, um, man, there's, there's a couple, I would say second Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. I think it's, mm. I think that is the gospel mm. um, summed up in, um, summed up in one verse. It's, it's, I'm, I'm broken and sinful and Jesus came and willingly took that on, took on the punishment and judgment that I deserve so that I can be clothed in his righteousness. It's, um. Mm. Yeah, I, I think if um, if more people would come to it, more Christians would um, truly understand who they were and who they are now, like you're clothed in his righteousness, I think it would um, truly transform the way that we live our lives. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and obviously, if more believers heard that message, it would be. Yeah. No, yeah, seeing yourself in that light. Because you have you have to see yourself who you are apart from Christ first. Hmm. That's because if you don't see that, then you'll never notice your need for a Savior. Um, and the fact that I think it just shows how great God's love for us is. Hmm. That's good. That's a good one. I do. I, I agree. I think that is a maybe if you combine the two of those, it's the it's the gospel message and yeah. then the impact. But I, yeah, anyways, that's solid. Good one. What's the next question? All right, let's see. <clears throat> How do you see the role of the Holy Spirit in guiding a biblical perspective? I would rephrase it slightly. How do you see, like, the Holy Spirit can't, in, can't in, the in, in living <laughs> the Christian life, or you could say the biblical worldview. But you know what I'm saying? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. what is the role of the Holy Spirit in the Christian's life? Um, I, it's your turn to answer first, oh, right? Oh, that's just good. <laughs> um, well, I think he guides us and leads us um, into truth. Um, I'm trying to think of a, let me try to look up a passage real quick. Uh, Do you know which passage you're looking for? I think for? it's First John 2, maybe. I mean, yeah, I think there's a, a lot of places in the New Testament that um, I'm going to ramble while you're looking. Yeah, go ahead. Um where it's clear that the, the the Holy Spirit is is going to be bring remembrance to the apostles of the things that Jesus has done and being a guiding light and the 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 yeah the part that if we if we're open to receive and be attuned with the Spirit and being aware of it, it you know the Holy Spirit's actions and movements and promptings in our lives like we can desensitize our, ourselves to that i believe but also can be fully aware and expecting and in tune with through prayer and and focus um be guided by it so yeah what's your what's the this verse not the verse i thought it was um oh no oh gosh um 
I'll read it though. Yeah. Um, I write these things to you. This is First John two. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in Him. Um, there's another there's another passage that talks about the role of the Holy Spirit bringing to remembrance the words of Christ, and I think mm-hmm. <clears throat> as we as we commit ourselves to reading the Word of God, the Holy Spirit teaches us, um, and then in that, as we go out into our lives, He will bring to remembrance the truths that Scripture reveals. Um, and also, as we walk by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will be developed in our, in our lives. And um, Yeah, I can't think of... I mean, I think it's it's the the indwelling spirit. Like we're now indwelled by the very spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. We've been anointed with it. We've been sealed with the promise um, of the Holy Spirit. And the the Holy Spirit is the one that does the sealing Uh in Christ, I believe. Um, So very active and moving in a Christian's life. I think it's our, our job, our responsibility, our response ability to respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and be fully aware. Because I think, now, I do think it can be um, abused or neglected, mm-hmm. uh, the, the concept. Mm-hmm. Because it's not just a concept, it's a person. Mm-hmm. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. It's something to be in relationship with. And it's always pointing us to Christ, I believe. I think that the that, Spirit of I God think, is always pointing to a, Christ. I think that's important. I think... Um, a lot of times people don't see the Holy Spirit as being an actual, per- mm-hmm. it, it, the, uh, the third person of the Trinity. Yeah. That there's a personhood there. There's the, the it's the spirit of God himself that's yeah. come and dwelt, dwelling inside of us that we've now partaken of. And and then again, it's to the, it's like, how exactly does that? I can't scientifically show you how that works. Um, it's a, it's, it's trusting in faith. Um, and I do, if like, if you're aware of and not neglecting and trying to be in tune with and focused on and appreciate and, um, again, be aware and have that perspective that, that the Lord's trying to tell me something every moment of every day, and I'm going to live with that. I'm going to assume that that's the case. I'm going to live <laughs> as if that's the case because it is the case. You're going to start seeing the Holy Spirit moving in your life all over the place. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, talk to that person. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Maybe we don't go that down that road. That's not the direction we need to go in our life. Hey, you know what? You're. It's going to bring conviction. It's going to bring um, encouragement in times of of sadness. So it's like, or you. <clears throat> so that that's the not wanting to neglect it. I personally have never been part of like a charismatic community of believers Mm -hmm. so i personally have not i've just that's just not the the vein of protestant christianity that i've ever participated in i've been adjacent to it enough to kind of be aware of the things and it's like i'm not saying that none of that is authentic and i'm not saying that all of it is authentic i'm saying like there there needs to be that this is kind of on the side where I'm like, it could be abused. It can be neglected yeah. Yeah. or abused. And sometimes it's like, I don't know. I'm not going to speak individually for any of <laughs> the folks that have had those experiences, speaking in tongues or um, prophetic visions. Or uh-huh. I, I just, me personally, I have not. Now, maybe I'm missing out on something. This is kind of getting away from the question, but I think it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. In internal discussion that christians have oftentimes that some are pressing like no there's there, it's the, the, you know the gifts of the spirit are still abundant and all around you're just not you don't have the faith to see it and others are like well dude you guys are abusing this this concept yeah and are really elevated this and are seeking out experiences that aren't necessarily always from the lord right and it's like obviously the truth is probably somewhere in the middle yeah i would what are your i would fully agree um i've been a part of um, more of a Pentecostal type church before, um, and so you definitely see both. I sides. can see you dancing in the yeah. aisles. Yeah, that was, I can picture it we're, now. We're not there anymore. Uh, 
Um, they didn't like your dancing? Yeah. They, they told me to get lost. <laughs> um, but well, it was Alicia speaking in tongues. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I, I see both sides of it, just like you said. Um, I, I tend to... I tend to fall more on the side. This is getting far, way far away from the question, but I tend to see it more, um, the spiritual gifts and all of that being more prevalent in, in places where the gospel's newer. Um, but I could be totally wrong. Being Uh, used as a miracles. Yeah. And a testament to that, that this word that's being spoken that we have no context for understanding of. is, And not to say that it's not present in, yeah, is it because yeah. the Lord doesn't want to work in that way in these situations, or is it because it's like we're literally we're we're cutting off that opportunity be, because of a lack of faith? Yeah. Uh, or am I seeking those things out, needing to have those spiritual experiences because I'm lacking faith? Does mm-hmm. that make yeah. like I, I'm seeking the 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 signs and the miracles because I have a lack of faith? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it gets um yeah, it, it but, starts getting so granular, yeah. granular that it gets to the each individual person's heart mm-hmm. and relationship with the Lord that they can only answer that themselves. Yep. You can you can view and have a perspective, examine the fruit from the outside, but ultimately it's going to be a, a personal relationship yep. with the Lord that they are either called to or convicted of or you can get anyways. Believe Ultimately, it. I think it's just you can either submit to the flesh or you can submit to the spirit. Yeah, I'm trying to get back. So, to what it. was the question? Read one more time. <laughs> I got so far off that. Um, how do you see the role of the Holy Spirit in guiding a biblical perspective? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, guiding a biblical perspective. Yes, um, I think we took it more of guiding the Christian's life. But yeah, yeah I think you summed it up nicely okay. at the end. You can either submit to the flesh or the spirit. All right. Question four. Hmm. I don't know. Is it not when you want to answer? No. Now, just remember, this is chat GPT yeah, generating so these, these questions. I'm trying so. to make sure the question makes sense. Are you questioning them? Here's, here's a good one. How should Christians approach social media with a biblical worldview? Hmm. Somebody who's not super active on social medias, like I'll scroll. I've got, I think I have, I don't even think I have Facebook app. I think I scroll through it on the internet occasionally. Um, I've had Twitter slash X before. I've had Instagram before, but I've never had TikTok. So for me, it's like, it's not a huge, I've, I've like, honestly, I did get back on, on X after Donald Trump's assassination attempt Mm -hmm. because I just want to see what's going on. And that lasted like two weeks. And I'm like, okay, I don't need to be on here anymore. Like it's just chaos Uh, (laughs) and a terrible use of time. (laughs) There is some interesting, some good breaking news in the moment that like stuff that I did not see. Now again, it's like, how true is it? Who who knows? (laughs) It was like, how much time do I want to give? How much attention do I want to pay? So I think just like anything else, it can be used as a great tool to share the gospel, to stay in contact with friends, to have relationship. Like I know Mackenzie posts a lot of pictures of the family and the girls and like my grandmother in in Arizona, my granny, um, who just bought some medical stuff, but she's doing well. She's recovering, strong believer. My my dad's mom, um, she loves scrolling through and seeing it all. Mm -hmm. Um, so she, she gets a great opportunity to, to keep up. And so it's like, there's some great blessings and benefits to it. Now, the connectivity, we also get the chaos uh-huh. and the time suck and the attention distraction and the emotional, you know, disagreements and arguments and hatred and all that stoked and cultivated, but you could also use it as an opportunity for, so it's not. It's again, yeah. what are you using yeah. it for? How are you using it? And how are you, it, it goes back again, I think very individual. It's like, how are you, like we, we're trying to use it to spread mm. the message of this podcast. Yep. Okay. Or we could use it to spread venomous hate and comments towards people all day and yeah. scroll through it, looking for comments <laughs> and likes or whatever. 
So yeah, it, it's a tool, and you can, you know, you can use a hammer to hammer and nail, or you can use a hammer as a murder weapon. What? <laughs> um, sorry, we, me and Alicia were watching a show on Netflix, and it was <clears throat> or Apple TV. But um, you guys got all the subs, yeah, we got all the subscription. All of them. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I I post sometimes on social media, and I typically only try to post share Bible verses or or anything dealing with you know Christianity, or I'll post pictures of Adeline or something. And also, um, you know, we're in the process of adopting, and we have a Facebook page that's dedicated just to that so that's a tool that's being used Hmm. for that so i mean it can be used as a good thing and again it goes back to what you said the you know the heart of what's going behind it um but it's just like anything else you know it's what what are you using it for yeah yeah but i do i do i do think there's just so many pitfalls and harms of of it it just has to be used very mm-hmm. with a lot of wisdom yeah. and um, discernment because it can easily become a thing that is not, it, it is life. It's mm-hmm. real life. Like social media is part of real life, but it's not real life. Like yeah. if you just don't pay attention to it, it's just sitting out there in the ether and in the internet. It. You don't need it. Yeah. And you, I mean, maybe it's a good practice to, for Christians and for anybody for that matter to, take time away like uh fasting from yeah. it. I, I mean i do hear people for lent i did 40 days no social media that's it's cr- like that's crazy. you know what i'm saying it. it is because but it becomes so addictive and they create the the, the algorithms and the mm-hmm. apps to be addictive and like constantly i mean tiktok now like i've never downloaded it but i could see how yeah i mean you I'll, could get i'll mm. scroll on reels on instagram i'm just like sometimes i'm like I've been sitting here for. Oh, I'll scroll short sometimes on YouTube. Yeah, because my that's my biggest social media. I guess if you call it social media, I, I use it to watch. I'm driving a lot, so I'll listen to things all the time. Mm-hmm. Not watching. He's while watching. I'm while yeah, I put it. I, <laughs> I glue it over my my sunglasses so I can see. Um, <laughs> then the road constantly distracting me from the video I'm trying to watch. <laughs> um, but no, yeah. So I, anyways. It can, it's just a time suck. And, and I love the concept. And again, this is a simple concept. You just say it slower. Pay attention. What are you paying your oh. attention to? Is it cultivating something in your life that is positive and like growing closer to the Lord and with deeper wisdom and understanding? Or is it cultivating, uh, uh, you know, yeah. a quick Despair. jittery thinking and, and disoriented and constant need for more like almost like an addict yeah. mentality and i think social media does cultivate that um the inability to sit patiently and do nothing yeah like yeah and it yeah causes people to because you go anywhere nowadays you see anybody waiting anywhere everybody's pretty much like yeah yep. down on the phone yeah Anyways. yeah so use with it's very great nice. discretion and Wisdom. What do we got next? <laughs> this is fun, by the way. I kind of yeah, I like this. Um, not sure how good the answers are for my. <laughs> uh, your, yours have been great no, and concise. I'm rambling. Well, the Allens have more words mm. to say than. Mm. What's there's? I know there's a saying that says like, "A wise man says nothing." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. I'm so wise. <laughs> Um, here you go. What What does it mean to be salt and light in the world? You go for it. All right. So, light is um, you're you're lighting up the darkness. You're ex- it can be exposing things that I was I had to go up to Fayetteville. Um, was it a couple weeks ago? Um, so I had to leave kind of early in the morning. Um, so the sun was still below the tree line. And when I was driving, I was like, oh, my windshield kind of looks dirty. 
Then as the sun got up over the trees, I was like, man, my windshield is filthy. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's bird poop all over it. And I was like, good Lord, we should have washed my car again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, as soon as the sun got above the tree line, I was like, this is filthy. And I think that's what the light can do. Mm, but good. it's not, it's not, tr- it, that's what it does by its nature. It exposes yes. the, the filth and the, and the imperfections and all that. Um, and I think by us being the light, that's naturally going to um, expose the darkness. We're not going out and trying to point out the imperfections and all that stuff, but the light of Christ is in us and everywhere that we go, we're going to be shining on in the dark. And so it's going to expose those things. Mm. Um, And salt, salt can be, salt has a few different uses, right? It can season food. um, It can preserve. um, It can irritate. It can, um, isn't there like a sanitation quality to it, mm-hmm. sanitizing? Yeah, because you have different grades of salt for food, and then you have salt to put on the roads to help when it snows. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll let you tackle that one. Well, I think you've named some of those things, and light as well, but think about them practically first, and then see what it means in the analogy or the you know, the teaching of what it would mean then to be that as a believer in the world. So it's like, if the world loses its, if the, if it goes to darkness, well, then everything's chaos. You can't see where you're going. There is no illuminating the path. There is no, you can't see, you can't, you can't see, and you can't see what, I mean, for, so I, I go down to the individual level again. So, okay. So like, what does it mean to be light? Well, Light is illuminating. By its nature, it illuminates, brightens, it warms, you could say, in some Mm. senses, like a fire, Um, the sun. There's a a warming effect. Now, it can also reveal reveal beauty. Mm -hmm. The sun rises on a beautiful sunset or on a beautiful landscape, and you're like, oh, this is just beautiful. I couldn't see this in the darkness. So it can illuminate and bring to light beauty. It can also illuminate a battlefield after there's torn bodies all over the place and destruction and death all around. And it's like, Oh, the sun, the sun is doing what the sun does. It's illuminating. The light is coming and bringing it. It's revealing what is unseen and it can reveal beauty. It can reveal, um, death and destruction and darkness. And it's like, are you, what kind of, so there's that. So it's like, as Christians, what are we called to? We're called to be the light of the world. We're, we're called to be illuminate. We're bring illumination and, and, brightness and and color to the environment and point to and help guide the path to what is true and and ultimately christ is the truth Mm -hmm. um and point to that and and bring and bring light to darkness to help we're called to be known as people that bring that to others and to sacrificially serve and and do those things in the world like that's what christians should be known as Mm -hmm. when non-believers think of us um and then the saltiness is like yes if if things lose their flavor if there's if you're trying to preserve the food if you're trying to um i mean yeah salt's used for many different things so that that one is a little bit harder than the light um i i do think that it's um like if salt loses its saltiness, what's the use for? It's basically just used as, as it's yeah. like little stones, pebbles that, that has no purpose. So it's like we don't want to lose our saltiness. We don't want to lose. We, we should be flavoring um, whatever it is we're tossed on with the flavor <laughs> of Christ <laughs> um, to keep the analogy going. But, you know, what I'm saying it's like wherever we're spread, we should be serving the function. And the function is so for, for salt, the function whatever it's being thrown on it's like reveals what the function is mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying if it's being thrown on food to to flavor it because it's already been cooked and you're ready to eat well now it's there to bring flavor and more enjoyment in that in that meal if it's thrown on the roads while it's snowing well it's not there for consumption flavor, yeah. it's there to serve a, a functional purpose of helping to clear the roads of dangerous ice so it's like as christians we should be but it, it's it's got to be in all those roles 
it's because the salt is salt. Mm -hmm. It's because it has its saltiness, the characteristics that is salt. It can now function in all these different roles because of its very nature. Now, Christians, our very essence, our very nature is now Christ in us. And we can function in many different scenarios and situations and bring that saltiness, that Christ likeness to those circumstances. But it depends. It's circumstance dependent, always with the same nature functioning. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's Mm, that's solid. We'll leave it there. I finally get to end one that's decent. All right. Uh, I kind of this. This is fun. Yeah. I hope I hope the audience is enjoying (laughs) as much as we are. This will probably be our most views. Since just oh, you even know because now you're jumping around. You're not going in order. Yeah, so uh, how many questions them, have we some asked? Some of them are not. Some of them are kind of a um, a dud, dud, and kind of like a the same question. Sorry for the delay. I've got my list too. You can always pull. Yeah. Do you have one? I there? wanted to get to the one. <laughs> How do you navigate political issues mm. through a biblical lens? I just rambled for a minute, so I'll let you start. Um, hmm. I need a second to formulate my. All right, I can start rambling. Um, I think this. So th- this this principle, I believe, applies not only in the political realm, but in any realm that we deal with that is um, on this side of on this side of death um, in this life. There's this. Um, how does my biblical worldview influence my politics and like involvement in it? Is that basically the mm, question? Yeah. Um, it's the same t- to me. So it's like a one my guiding principles are Christ is Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just a set of propositional true statements. It's a person and, and as revealed in the scriptures. And so that, that is my, and then my foundational perspective is that ultimately everything in this world is going to pass away. It's not the end. It's not the end all be all like this is going to be rolled up like a scroll Mm -hmm. and there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. And those who are in Christ it's 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 heaven you know we're we're going to be in full communion we're going to be known as we are already fully known we're not going to be seeing in a mirror dimly so like we have this hope this transcendent home that is beyond whatever the world circumstances are so you can apply that to work you can apply that to chaos and and struggle going on you can apply that to in this case politics right so there's this um i think a healthy detachment and distance from what it is that's going on, all the chaos, the fr- like it's not going to get me mm-hmm. to a point of boiling over of hopelessness, uh, yeah, hopelessness yeah, yeah. or utter frustration. I'm not going to be <laughs> elated to the point of like, yes, we're the best. If we win and if we lose, I'm not going to be devastated because that's not where my hope is placed. Right. All that being said, I'm also my politics and my view on politics and what direction the country should be going and, and general principles and decisions that the government should be making are influenced by my Christian perspective and worldview. So it's like, I'm going to vote most in line with what, knowing that there is nobody, I'm not voting for Jesus up there. He's not running. Mm -hmm. He's transcended that game altogether. He is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And in the end, he's, he's going to be back. Um, So there's this, there's a, a healthy level of detachment of where I'm not putting my hope in these things, but I think also a healthy level of engagement. This is the city I live in. This is the state I live in. This is the country I live in. This is the time and place I live in. I think it's, there's a, a, a responsibility to vote for the candidates and the policies and the party that most align Excellent. closely, knowing that neither one of them is yeah. perfect. Yeah. I, I, I hear people say that um, you have to vote for the lesser evil. <clears throat> I would say you have to vote. I can't remember who I heard say this, but for the greater good, for the greatest mm. good, <clears throat> because like you said, Jesus isn't on the, there's, he's no, there's nowhere to vote for Jesus. Um, and so that's, 
I have to vote for the candidate or the <clears throat> policies that are in most alignment with that, knowing that they're not going to perfectly align with the truths laid out in mm-hmm. Scripture. Um, and I think it's – we do have this um, – Jesus is king regardless, right? It yep. doesn't – if – the Democrats win or the Republicans win, the truth is, stays the same. Um, and like you said, there should be a level of disengagement, but also a level of engagement because the truth is that the policies that are in place and everything that's wrapped up in the political sphere has real life implications, yes. um, you know, whether it be with, you know, kids and transgenderism and all that stuff um and and what's being um placed in their minds yeah um because so there's definitely real life ramifications of it yeah yeah well 100 percent. so i'm not trying to make it sound like um no i wasn't saying that. and i know you i know you weren't saying that but maybe for clarification sake for the audience it's like yes i think a good level of engagement i think all, all that is very positive and full awareness especially on the local level like how these policies will and laws will impact your personal life and your children's lives and 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 all of that um at the same time it's not where i find my hope Mm -hmm. but it can go real so i mean most of history is filled with disaster after disaster after disaster because of political Mm -hmm. situations and revolutions i mean the russian revolution i mean six to ten million people in ukraine were starved to death after that yeah in the Soviet Union. It's like, we don't really hear about that much, but that's a political, that's very much a political outflowing. Like these people, I mean, Maoist China, murdered. I mean, millions and millions. Nazi Germany, millions and millions of people, Jews, to concentrate. I mean, there is the real ramifications in this world and real evil and suffering can be brought about when the wrong politics and policies and... um mind viruses are propagated and overtake a population Mm -hmm. now as christians we're called to in face of that always again we do we have a hope that transcends all of that and we can really live in that but doesn't mean that we just detach and say well whatever happens happens no worries it's also like yeah whatever happens happens no worries yes that's true because we're solid but let's engage let's make the world Knowing that ultimately this is not what saves the world, Mm -hmm. finding the perfect political system is not what's going to save the world. It's hearts being changed and transformed that's going to save the world and ultimately Christ returning. Um, So it's it's, it's just this healthy balance. There's so much of that in the Christian life in general, not just with politics, but in everything. It's like you can go way off the rails here. You could go way off the rails here. And then there's this middle path, this the narrow (laughs) path, the narrow way. that is Christ, that yeah. is wisdom and discernment and proper balancing. Um, and I think we need to bring that to our politics too, because it's yeah. not where our identity is found. Mm-mm. Our identity yeah. found is Christ first, and that, that identity in Christ influences and guides our politics. Yeah. The starting point is Christ. The yes. starting point is not you know, which political party you are affiliated with. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and being salt and light in those engagements. Yeah. <clears throat> How many right. questions have we done? Do you know? I don't know. I've skipped around. Six. Six or seven? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. You need, when do you need to leave? We're at 40. I'm good till. Okay. I'm good for a little bit. 630. <laughs> How do you respond to those who challenge your beliefs? Hmm. I yell at them and then walk away. <laughs> I hit them in the I head. Take with my, my ball and go home. <laughs> you do them over the head with my Bible. <laughs> um, Sadly, that's how a lot of people are. Yeah. But, so, how do I deal with people who challenge my beliefs? A uh, one. I have as much fun or more fun talking to people that I disagree with mm-hmm. 
than I do talking with people I do agree with. Yeah. So for me, it's not, um, now, I, again, I'm in a, in a sense, a sheltered bubble. I don't get, I live in the South. I still, there's still a residual Bible Belt effect going on here. Uh-huh. Um, many people identify as Christian. So it's like, it's not offensive to them if you say, oh yeah, the Lord's been, you know, really blessed our business. If I talk to a customer or like, that's not going to generate a lot of, you know, hatred right. or argumentation. So I don't, I really don't have to face it a lot. Um, Here, here's, let me phrase it this way. How would you? So, yeah, yeah. So to the point of like, how would I? So like one, I, I, I would, it depends too on what level of engagement, like I, I can picture somebody just yelling at you. It's like, well, there's not going to be a lot of fruitful uh-huh. discussion there or, or interaction. Like you, you have, I, so I was walking around Asheville one time. This is like eight years ago, went with another couple, Mackenzie and I, we love going up there. Um, beautiful area, but it's very, there, there's very liberal woke leanings, especially kind of a hippie vibe too. So it's not, I guess what I'm saying is cool city, but also not like, where you're going to go find like a, there are Christian movements going on. Don't get me wrong, but that's not the vibe of the city. It's right. kind of that hippie free spirit. Like I'm spiritual man, but don't put me in a box yeah. type vibe. Yeah. And there's this guy kind of walking around in the street. I can't remember what he said, but he said something like try to hand me a pamphlet or something. And I was like, th- my response back to him was like Jesus. Cause I can't remember what he asked exactly, but he was very offended by that. And like got visibly angry in the face, like almost to the point where it was like something was going on beyond. And that was the only interaction. He got angry, didn't say another word and walked away. Right. It's like, okay. He didn't want to hear that. He didn't want to hear that Jesus was the answer. So uh, now if that guy had stood there and yelled at me, it's like, well, to some level, it's like you, you got to disengage because that's not going to be a fruitful conversation. Right. Like the mob is rising up. Like Paul would leave or go to somewhere else Mm -hmm. and to to find out, seek out receptive ears. So we're not there to be, um, first off, the gospel in Jesus Christ is contentious. It's sharper than two. It's offensive, yeah. It is going to cut because it's it's the truth, and the truth can hurt sometimes if you're on the wrong side of it. Right. Um, It can be convicting. So there's going to be conflict, but it's also like I'm not seeking out the conflict just to be contentious. It's like the gospel will do that in and of itself. Yeah. Jesus Christ will do that in and of himself by his very character because it is if you are living in sin and you are turned away, there's going to be conflict. So it's like be prepared for that. Be ready to engage somebody who's honestly asking questions and wanting to have a discussion. Um but yeah, I guess that's kind of a long way of saying I didn't really answer the question. But... <laughs> no, I think take? um yeah, I think we already have an offensive message so there's no point in adding anything offensive else to offensive, the flesh. offensive to the flesh um what is it first peter second peter says always be ready to give a defense for the gospel mm-hmm. but do it with gentleness and um respect mm-hmm. um and if you're walking by the spirit that's what's going to come out of you when you're come against people who are in conflict with your belief <clears throat> yes. Um, I guess it's easier said than done for most people, um, because when because when you're in those situations, it's very easy to go by the flesh. <clears throat> what was the question one more time? Just so I get the frame of it right. Not that I'll, I'll, maybe I'll answer it again. Let's see if I can do better. How do you respond to those who challenge your beliefs? Um, well, yeah. Okay. So th- I, I went way off <laughs> per my usual um, with love. I mean, that, yeah. that's what we're called to. Do I always do that? No. And how often do I really get challenged in my beliefs? Not often. And in fact, I would enjoy that kind of conversation. Yeah. Um, one on one with an individual. What would not be fruitful is like, uh, I'm not in a place to go challenge a month of bunch of scientific atheists like i'm just not equipped for that like william lane craig can do that yeah yeah you know so i can only control my little the interactions that i have individual so it's like go in love yeah um with truth yeah but in love 
with a, yeah. a bent towards love and desire not to win an argument, yeah, but to genuinely love on the other person. Yeah. So I think most people do, even within Christianity, it's not going to seek truth. It's going to win an argument. I mm. think that would yeah. help a lot of those situations. <clears throat> Number seven or eight or 10. <laughs> Next question. Get to the other list. What is the significance of the Great Commission in shaping a believer's mission? What do you think? Um, I think a lot of times we can see the Great Commission as, oh, that's the pastor's job. Um, but that that's the call of every believer is to be a disciple and go and make disciples. Um, and the the mission's the same for everybody, but the means by which we carry out that mission is different. Hmm. Um, so a pastor, a janitor is no less um, a disciple or a disciple maker than a pastor. Hmm. Um, and I think we've, I think the church has made a, a, a misstep in that, um, you know, we, we generally pass that off to the pastor um but i think when you when you understand like we're all priests right we're we're a royal priesthood so um it's our job i i think the great commission is more dependent on the people in the pews of the church than it is just the pastor Mm -hmm. i think without the people in the church going and making disciples christianity is is not going to spread at all um, and I think that's the the biggest problem with with the church. Yeah, and there's not. It's like if you if you, again, this maybe is a bad analogy, but think of Christianity as a a large all, all members. I mean, we, we, I guess it's not. I'm gonna just use the analogy of the Bible. Use the body of Christ. There's not a single member of the body of Christ that does not have the mission statement or role and responsibility of sharing and spreading the gospel. Mm -hmm. Um, It is an evangelical um, gospel sharing Christianity. Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's very part of its very nature. It's woven into the fabric of what Christianity is, is to share the gospel, not to retreat and don't tell anybody about this mysterious thing, Mm -hmm. religion that you're following. No, we're called to share. Yeah, and you, to tell. we're not called to be, you know, go be a monk and not to hide or light under a basket. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. Yeah, there's seasons for that, right? Mm-hmm. But as a calling to our, our our perspective, our worldview, our religion, our our relationship with Christ is to share that relationship with others and invite them to also participate. It's the very nature of it. So it's like, not that that is the end all be all of what. It's not like. I, I think the most thing, the big, the the main purpose is to be in relationship with God Himself mm-hmm. through the person of Jesus Christ. That that's that's what we are created for, and to shine His light in the world yep. as we submit through faith. Um, so it's like this, just the overarching. There's not a single Christian out there, to, regardless of what their vocation or role is, that shouldn't be participating in that yep. and have that as the overarching principle by which they conduct themselves with the world. Yeah. So, yeah. So <clears throat> remember uh, when we had coach lamb on, he said that, I don't know if it was on the podcast or not, but he mm-hmm. said that he knew he was, he wasn't called to be a teacher. He was just called to use teaching as a tool. Um, and I think that's, that rings true for all of us. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Let me ask you this one. Cause we've got, Maybe time for two more. Okay. Depending on how this one, how long this one takes. How does the biblical worldview address the concept of human freedom and responsibility? Um. Say, read it one more time. How does the biblical worldview? I haven't get exactly right. I was trying to remember it. Um. 
How does the biblical worldview address the concept of human freedom and responsibility? Um, I think I think we've been given freedom to make choices. I think that's from the very beginning in the garden. We can either choose to be in relationship with God or we can choose to go our own way. Um, and I think true freedom is, um, you know, a lot of people think of freedom as being able to just go out and do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But I think true freedom is being in submission to God because that's what you were created for. Mm. Um, being in submission to your created purpose. Right. Because that's, because everything else is going against the, like going against that. Like sin, I mean that's that that's the whole fall is going against the design of man. Um, mm. And then what was freedom and responsibility? Mm. Um, and then ultimately we have the responsibility. Um, we we have the ability to respond. Touching on last week, um, like it, it's it's on us to make that decision and make that choice. Um, I'll let you go from there. Um, yeah, so I, I've got a... Uh, Is that the general direction you were going with yeah, that yeah. question? Yeah, yeah, no, and that, that I think that's... How does your biblical worldview inform the question? Because people, anybody could ask this question, and atheists do, and non-believers do, and athe agnostics do. It's like, how would you answer the question of our, you know, the free will question, are, are human beings genuinely free moral agents who are morally responsible for their actions? Do they have a level of freedom and autonomy in their decision-making and abilities? And like, I, I, you know, there's many atheists, and I think they're logical and correct in this conclusion, given their worldview. Now, let, let's assume, mm -hmm. I don't agree with this, but let's assume that there is no God, there is no creator. And somehow the Everything popped into existence from nothing. Grant that, you know, the absurdity that you have to, the, the leap of faith you have to take to, they often say, like, give me the first miracle that everything comes into existence from nothing, and then I can explain everything else. It's like, well, that's a pretty huge, huge leap yeah. for you, you're taking there. But anyways, besides the point, um, imagine that there is no God, there is no creator. All that there is is time, space, and material matter all the way down to quarks and the quantum level. And really all that is, is guided by the laws of quote unquote physics, not quote unquote, but the laws of physics that, that just material matter moving through time and space. And really once the big bang starts, all you have is let's very much simplify it, but it's like breaking the balls on a, on a, on a pool table. Mm -hmm. And now they, they're going to bounce based on that initial strike of the, the cue ball. And they're going to bounce by the laws of physics in the exact lines and orientations and bounce off the walls of the, the edges of the table. And they're going to do what they do simply because of the way that the ball was struck to begin with. Right. And that's basically what they're saying is like, look, everything that's happened since the Big Bang, everything that's happened afterwards is just the laws of physics, the billiard balls bumping on the table. Yeah, we're Set just, into motion. Yeah. And now everything, this illusion that we have of free choice and free will is is just that illusion. it is a complete illusion everything is determined through mechanical physical mechanics of it the physics yeah. of it all it's just matter bumping into matter and this this illusion of free will and decision making is all false the murderer who murdered did it because that was just a chain reaction of molecules bumping in vastly more extravagant and detailed and than a pool table but nonetheless just same, physical yeah. properties same concept the, the moral Moral truths, I mean, again, now that to me is utter absurdity the and fact crap. That, the fact that we're having this conversation is just the um, the end result of certain the matter words, bumping into together. The it's, words that I'm forming uh, and your ability to comprehend them, again, and then their ability to go on podcasts and argue for this point. <laughs> it's like, who are you arguing with? <laughs> what difference does it make? It's all determined, right? Yeah, like, And yeah. the, the murder of murder, because, so it's like, yes, they're but I get to see what I see why that's the case. If you don't think that consciousness exists, that God exists, that it, it really is just a chain reaction. Yeah. 
and there is no genuine true freedom to, to make moral and there's no genuine moral responsibility so most religions will get you some of the way i think christianity has the deepest view on human autonomy and freedom and moral responsibility and so it does inform those things now there's a inner varsity debate on some of those things but even the calvinistic worldview will, will say that man is morally responsible and free to act in accordance with his nature mm -hmm. so I do think even on that side of the, which I disagree with they just vehemently, can't act against uh, that nature. At exactly. All. Um, but long story short, so yes, it, it, it people are morally responsible agents, and stop. So like when they make decisions, they are morally responsible for those decisions, um, and then freedom. Man is free to decide what and what. Now that does not negate that there's not influences. Like if you're hungry and tired, you might act out in anger a little bit easier than mm -hmm. if you're fully fed and doesn't. It still doesn't justify the behavior or make it right. Right. But there are underlying factors that help understand those things. So, um, but yeah, we, and we're we're created moral agents. So morality exists. We are able to respond to those things and make those decisions, and we're we're free to decide. We have autonomy. We have the ability. We're creating God's image. <clears throat> And that's the only way that love can exist is if there's a choice. Yes. If you have the ability to choose or reject. Agreed. One more. One more. Last one. You got a good one. Well, you look too. I've got I've got a couple, but um, I think there's one at the. I've got. You got one. You got one. Yes. What is a Christian? Well, this one, this is kind of like a good one to end on, but because it's like the end, <laughs> what is the Christian hope for the future? According to the scripture mm. that Christ will be all in all. <laughs> Was it first Corinthians is it five twenty eight, something like that. Um, also in Ephesians 1. Colossians is. It's in Colossians somewhere too, right? Perhaps. Um, I think the... Read the question again. What is the Christian hope for the future according to the scriptures? Um, and we will be... I mean, it's... It's the, um, it's the ultimate destination of everyone in Christ. It's... It's being in the presence of God. It's um, being in relationship with with no. Um, it, it's the idea of not the the mirror not being dimly lit. It's it's being fully in His presence. It's um, being in relationship with Him and diving in the depths of Him and never getting to the end. Mm. Um, and also being in relationship with all of those in Christ in perfect unity um, and just, yeah, it, it's, I, I, there's not enough words to really. Yeah, I, I think it's the, um, aren't we, are we not going to be floating around the sky in class? <laughs> um, that's a new heaven and a new earth. I love it. I love, because I, I do think that's, it, it grounds it. It's like, no, we will be experiencing in a very different way, more vivid way, with never diminishing returns, um, and always, I've heard it said, like a spiraling upward, mm -hmm. like a continuous, perfect, but becoming more perfect in a way. It's like, I can't, can't even wrap your mind around it. Yeah. It's transcendent. It's beyond our ability to comprehend, but it's going to be, and I think the Bible is very clear in this, that for those who are in Christ, in the end, that all things will be made right, and everything will be well, it says it in Ephesians and in, in First Corinthians that, and again, whatever this means, I don't know, but it, it is a summing up of all things back to their proper order and orientation and in complete harmony and attunement with the transcendent. Mm. Christ will be all in all. God will be all in all in Ephesians 1, it says. And um, a summing up of all things. It's like a, a perfect conclusion to 
all the sorrows and tears and destruction and death will be consumed and dealt with. And there will be, everything will be made right. It's like what, in the most satisfying way possible, and justice will be served perfectly. And it's just like, you can't even imagine that that's the case. And you could say, look, that's, that's fairy tale. That's, um, I mean, that's what the Bible lays out. That's what yeah. the truth, that's the hope that we have ultimately. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and then if you live with that hope, it does transform your life. And if it, it can, you can endure much suffering and difficulty through this life, which is certain to come. If you have that proper orientation towards the hope that is to come that you can, um, and that faith that it, it will, it will come to pass. Yeah. Yeah. You see th- this life is but a vapor. And when you see it in light of eternity, I think it, puts everything in its proper perspective mm. <coughs> amen amen do you have any idea how many questions we uh, i don't got? know i'll have to maybe seven or eight yeah it feels right to me yeah seven maybe maybe close to ten close to ten well, well i enjoyed this one yeah man. that was, was good, good. good. you're gonna pray us out i'll pray us out all right so glad josiah wasn't here yeah <laughs> just kidding man we'd got through two questions <laughs> No. I'm as long-witted as him sometimes, so I, I give him I a hard time, know. but I'm... I don't know if you're that long. I ramble. Nah. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for um, this podcast. Thank you for um, all that you do for us, Lord. And I just pray that something that we've said this morning will strike a chord in someone to um, want to explore you more and dive deeper um, into relationship with you. Um, and if someone's listening that... Um, doesn't know you, Lord, that it will drive them to want to get to know you um, and pursue you. And Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until next time.